Hello and welcome. I am so excited to welcome all of you to Alta Live as our Zoom room fills up. It is my job to give you the lay of the land. My name is Beth Spotswood. I'm the digital editor at Alta Journal and your host for Alta Live. I am so happy to see so many of you joining us for a conversation on the winning of Barbara Worth, a hugely successful California novel that few have ever heard of and its setting in California's Imperial Valley. Peter Fish wrote a fascinating feature in the current issue of Alta, um, all about Barbara Worth, the Imperial Valley, what this incredible novel meant for the Imperial Valley then, the, the kind of implications and, and what has happened to the Imperial Valley since. Um, and that's, that's in the current issue of Alta. Peter is a San Francisco writer, editor, and teacher. He was Sunset Magazine's travel editor for many years. Currently, he regularly reviews books for the San Francisco Chronicle and teaches travel and nature writing for Stanford Continuing Studies. He is also a repeat contributor to Alta. Peter is joined today by Deborah Thornburg, an incredible resource of knowledge about the winning of Barbara Worth, the book's author, Harold Wright Bell, and the history of the Imperial Valley where she was born and raised. An educator, Deborah taught eighth grade at Pine School, a small country school for 38 years. After she retired, Deborah served as president of the Women's Club of Holtville, was a member of the Imperial Valley Choral Society's Master Chorale, and volunteered as a board member for the Imperial County Historical Society. Recently, Deborah was historian for the ICHS's Pioneers Museum. Shout out to them. I understand they're having a watch party right now. Woohoo, ICHS Hi Museum. Hi, everyone. Um, and she is currently working on the committee to further develop the museum's educational programs. Um, so those are our guests today. And, and if you've got tons of questions for them, which I'm sure you do, pop them in the Q&A button at the bottom or in the chat. But before we dive in, let me give you a pitch for this incredible magazine. Alta Live, which you are watching now, is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. If you are unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. You can join us as a member for as little as $3 a month and support the work we do get access to all of our archives. We invite we invite everyone to our parties that we have throughout the state. Um, we also present a monthly California book club, which is free and very fun to join. We present weekly events like this one today. If you haven't yet joined Alta, want to support independent um, and award-winning journalism about the West, now is a great time to consider joining us. In fact, a $50 annual membership comes with a hat a book, a guide to independent bookstores of California in the West, and four glorious issues of our magazine. So please do consider. Again, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. We'll chat for about 30 minutes, and then I will get to as many of your questions as we can. This interview will be recorded, posted to altaonline.com later today. We will also send you an email with a link to this video, Peter's article, um, invites to current events. We'll find a link to the Pioneer Museum and tell you all to go visit that as well. Um, it is so great to be here with our community today. Hi to Potomac, Maryland, Costa Mesa, Novato, New York City. I am in Novato, like our regular guest, Lynn Lombardo here. Peter and Barbara, or Deborah, where are you Zooming in from today? Deborah, let's start with you. I'm in Holtville, California. Um, in the Imperial Valley, like she said, I've lived here all my life and my living room. <laughs> Peter, where are you? I'm in my downstairs office in San Francisco in the outer sunset about uh, 10 blocks in from the ocean. Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, so I want to kind of dive in. I think first, Peter, we'll start with you. Could you give us the shortest Reader's Digest cliff notes of the winning of Barbara Worth? Um, some brief in, info on the author and just kind of set the scene for us. I'm happy to. And for everything I say this afternoon, Barbara is going to be my fact checker because she's the real expert. I am merely the magazine writer who came down there because I was so fascinated. And I've been fascinated by him for about 10 or 12 years. Uh, here, so I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. And Barbara, if, if I make any mistakes, you just shout. Okay. So Harold Bell Wright was a preacher turned novelist, grew up very poor, became a preacher, 
learned to be a preacher in the Ozarks in Kansas, arrived in California. By that point, he was starting to write books, novels. He arrived in the Imperial Valley in 1907. And for a writer looking for a good story, he arrived, he arrived at an especially lucky time. So the Imperial Valley was then the site of California's first big reclamation project, bringing water in from the Colorado River to irrigate the valley so that could be, the valley could be sold as farmland. But a couple of years before Wright got there, uh, a combination of heavy rains and really bad engineering turned this dream into a disaster. The irrigation canals and ditches flooded, drowned the farmland, created the Salton Sea, which was California's largest inland lake. So Harold Bell Wright knew a good story when he saw one. And he sat in his writer's cabin in the Imperial Valley and started writing a novel about an orphan girl, Barbara Worth, who was rescued as an infant from the cool desert and saved by the valley's richest man, Jefferson Worth. Worth is sort of big man in the valley, and he has dreams of turning the valley into a Garden of Eden by bringing in a system of dams and canals. But he's battling sort of corrupt Eastern capitalists who want to take control of everything and thwart his dream. So the book is about that. Barbara is torn between two suitors, a very kind of local uh, cowboy guy named Abe and a very suave uh, engineer, water engineer from the East. And she's torn between them. And then there's the Titanic flood and then a happy ending. So the book was published in 1911 and Wright hit pay dirt with it. The burning of Barbara Worth you know, was universally well-reviewed around the country and it sold like hotcakes from the day it was published in 1911. It became the third best-selling book of that year. Over the next 15 years, it sold nearly 3 million copies and it continued to sell and sell for decades, launching Wright's career, making him one of the most successful authors in America. And as I say in my article, I think it really helped Californians convince themselves that irrigation and bringing in water from the state and the West Rivers was what was going to make you know the state a powerhouse. Wow. All right. So, so this book was a huge, I mean, just a phenomenal national success made into a movie, a very big deal. Deborah, can you tell us a little bit about the, the novel's impact? on the Imperial Valley? What did it mean for the people and the, the community um, of its setting? Well, interestingly enough, when the book was released, it didn't make a big dent down here because at the time, the entire county population was about 13,000. There weren't a lot of people here. And I think the biggest city, El Centro, had something like maybe, maybe 2,000 people in it. That was it. There were no libraries. There were no public libraries. Um, there was a state library that would bring, a traveling library that would bring books down, 50 books a month. That was it. So it really didn't make a big impact. The, the biggest impact probably would be his friend, uh, William Franklin Holt, upon whom the, uh, the figure Jefferson Worth is based. William Franklin Holt built a hotel, the Hotel Barbara Worth. That hotel was a showpiece it was amazing it, at, in that time it had air conditioning it was huge but after the movie was released in 1926 then we have by the way it was a very successful movie with a very young handsome gary cooper in it um <laughs> after that we have barbara worth school barbara worth road barbara worth country club barbara worth drain ditch barbara worth canal barbara you get the idea <laughs> you know copyright laws i don't think were as uh, strict then and um uh, everybody cashed in on it it was almost like a celebrity endorsement so really the big big push to recognize barbara worth and make her kind of a trademark for the valley was after the movie not the book and it, and again, Barbara Worth, completely fictional character. Completely. Was she inspired, wasn't she inspired by, by any gal the most, in Imperial no, Valley? No, no. The, the one figure in the book that you can really relate to as a, a you know, historical figure is, like I say, Jefferson Worth. William Franklin Holt is the man who founded Holtville. He was um, a brilliant entrepreneur. And I have the feeling that he and Wright knew each other for 
many, many, many years. He was uh, he was born in Missouri and he lived in Redlands and he lived in Imperial Valley. I mean, they're they're very their lives were very much um, crossed paths quite a bit. Um, but but Holt put in the first telephone line from Imperial to Calexico. He started the newspaper, the Imperial Valley Press in 1901. He brought acreage in a part of the county that was elevated. So it wasn't hit by the flood. That's Holtville. Imperial and El Centro and all those places after the flood in order to recoup, they started raising their taxes and everything else. And the banks would not give loans to farmers. Wright said, not right, excuse me, Holt said, come to Holtville and we'll sell you this land with water rights with no down payment. So he attracted people here by being very, you know, magnanimous with that. He started the first ice plant, the first power plant, the first creamery, he had a grist mill. I mean, he really, really got an opera house in Holtville. I mean, he had, he was a brilliant. And what he would do is he'd start these businesses, he'd get them up, he'd get them running, and then he would sell them to the people who worked there. And yes, he made some profit off it, but he didn't gouge them. He made yeah. it so that this community would keep building. He was a really, really, I mean, I wish we had more like him. <laughs> um, Pierre, why don't you start by talking about this topic and then and we can, you know, ask Deborah to fill in the blanks. But can you talk about um, the geography, the community, the growth, the time of transition that the Imperial Valley was in as Harold Bell Wright was writing about it? Um, and then kind of and 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 contrast that, I guess, or compare that with the time of transition it's in right now. Yeah, um, I mean, as Deborah, you know, who's from there, knows better than I do. I think one of the real strengths of the book is, you know, and the book has its flaws, as Deborah will admit. It he just loves his adjectives. It's, it's real purple prose, but he took enormous care in describing the valley. The geography is right. The towns all have different names, but they're recognizably Holtville. Mm -hmm. They're recognizably El Centro. And similarly, um, when it came to the description of building the, you know, the irrigation canals and, and everything into the valley, he worked with hydrologists and engineers to get all that stuff right. And so it is, I think, People agree it's a very accurate depiction of what the Imperial Valley was just at the point when Colorado, the Colorado River, was about to turn it into really one of the most productive agricultural areas in the state of California. And in terms of the kind of novel's impact on, on the state, um, so if you know, if you read books like uh, Donald Wister's, you know, uh, Rivers of Empire, or Kevin Starr's, I mean, this is the era of California where all over the state, but especially in Southern California, people were thinking about irrigation because you had all this, you know, kind of fertile land, but it just needed water to grow stuff. This was sort of the first really big project, and it kind of set a template for the rest of the state. And the success, I think, of Barbara Worth um, as a novel and then as a movie was an incredible publicity boom for the idea that you could bring in water from someplace else. And one of the things that just most tickled me about, um, you know, when I was doing the research on this book, so in 1926, um, when the movie was released um, in October of 1926, there was a huge convention in Los Angeles of all over, all over the Western US of politicians, engineers, various people, and it was going to be, a, it was a convention uh, called the Winning of the West, and it was about how we were going to reclaim the West arid lands and turn them into productive farmland by, you know, big irrigation projects. And on the, one of the, the highlights of this convention was the premiere of the movie, The Winning of Barbara Worth. So it's this thing where this sort of popular culture and politics kind of collide. And I, you know, think that in its own funny way, this book and its movie contributed to projects like Hoover Dam and Gun Canyon Dam and in California, the, you know, Hetch Hetchy bringing water to San Francisco and then the LA Aqueduct bringing water down uh, from the Owens Valley to Los Angeles. It really made, um, when you read the book, you seem like it makes you feel like 
um, you know, building a canal, building a dam, turning a desert into productive cropland is just noble and heroic and, and a marvelous thing to do. So I think that's the one of the main lasting, um, you know, impacts the book has had on California and the West. Deborah, do you co-sign this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, manifest destiny. You know, it's there. We build it. They will come, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. It, we had a big, big immigration. When they first opened the valley um, in 1901, they first guaranteed water when you came to buy plots of land. And um, they were selling the acreage for a dollar and a quarter an acreage. And so we had for that first decade, a surprising amount of, of uh, immigrations, immigrants coming in. And um, some of them were defeated by the flood. Yes, yes. But they stuck it out. It's that pioneer spirit. Uh, you know, they. it's as uh, Wright said in his book, it was the coming of the strong ones. You know, they had that. They were pioneers. What a line. Yeah. And and. Now, more than 100 years later, or 97 years since the <laughs> movie came out, yeah. um, what are the ramifications of that? Are they positive or they have, has, are they negative? Where, where have we landed? Where, how, how has the Imperial Valley kind of transitioned from that manifest destiny of the early? Well, and, um, I would say that our heyday, as it were, was starting from about the 1940s uh, because of World War II, the nation needed food. And by that time, the technology and we had a labor source and it really, really, really bloomed. Uh, it was the winter, it is still the, you know, the winter vegetable garden of the United States. An amazing amount of produce comes out of this little valley. Um, it's it's gone from there and it's still predominantly i mean if if you were to look at any um wikipedia <laughs> article about the imperial valley they will call it agricultural and that is true that's the main focus but we've started we're we're also a hotbed of energy down here we have solar energy uh geothermal energy wind energy we have uh hydroelectric from the river itself and that's becoming one of our big exports is energy um that that's what heat will do for you. So <laughs> uh, also with uh, some of the malicadoras down along the uh, Mexican border, some of the big factories that can can then you know make use of the uh, labor force from Mexicali and then just bump it over the line and sell it up here. Those are also big industries. So it's not strictly agriculture anymore, but it's still predominantly agriculture. And in terms of the water issues, I mean, one of the things that really struck me when I started researching the story, which again, I've been thinking about writing for over 10 years, it, it became so much more newsworthy just in the last couple of years because the whole Colorado River Basin is dealing with this prolonged drought with the river flows much lower than they have been a long time with the you know reservoirs, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, you know, at really low ebb. And What's fascinating about kind of the water issues is because the Imperial Valley was one of the first agencies to lay a claim on the Colorado River back in the 1920s, by law, they got a big percentage of the river flow, 20% of the whole river. And that continues today, even though now, I mean, when they, you know, when when that they made that claim and it was approved, you know, Phoenix was a dinky town, Las Vegas barely existed. Um, and so there was really not that much competition for the water. Well, now there is. Mm -hmm. And what's happened, um, you know, just over the last year and, and really just accelerated really in the last couple of weeks is that, gosh, from San Diego, you know, all the way, you know, through the Southwest up to Colorado and Utah, uh, you know, the Department of Interior and Bureau of Reclamation and all sorts of local agencies have been really, you know, pulling their hair out to try and figure out what's going to be a fair way of allocating the Colorado River water in an era where there's much less water than was planned. And, um, you know, one of the people that is quoted in the article is a, a friend of, uh, of, of um, Deborah's, uh, J.B. Hamby, who's both a Barbara Worth fan and, and, a, and a water guy in the Imperial Valley. And 
Um, you know, they seem in just the last couple of weeks to have negotiated maybe a Band-Aid solution for about yeah. the next three years where they're going to be awarding Arizona and California, I think $1.3 billion of federal funding that will help um, ease the pain of having farmers reduce the amount of water they use. And, um, and then we're going to have to see what happens after that. But it's just funny, this one book and 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 this one you know really interesting really productive valley just you know i felt like it's become a symbol of all of the difficult choices that california and the west are going to have to make over the next you know quarter century mm -hmm. well they have to i'm sorry no uh, they, have to, <laughs> they have to be very careful about it because yes under you know 1900s 1850s the, the the law was you know first claim on the river you get it and the imperial valley did that and if they start questioning that claim it's then they're going to have to start looking at all the claims all along the rivers in the western states and so you know they have to be very delicate with these um negotiations and compromises that are that are happening it's it's a big chore and i'm glad other people are doing it and not me <laughs> One of the things I loved about doing the research is the water issues are so bitter. During the 1930s, Arizona and California got in such a fight over Colorado River water that Arizona sent out the National Guard. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> water is a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> um, I want to get back to the book if we can for a bit. Um, Deborah, can you... Can you tell us, that, like, when was the first time you read the book? Is this a signed reading in every... No, no, I read it, um, I was probably in my 20s, something like that. You know, it, I'd heard about the book, but I had never pick it up, and I did read it. Um, uh, it did not make a real big impact on me at that time. It was like, okay, because like, as, as Peter said, it's very, it's purple prose, and it's sometimes kind of hard to wade through that writing style is outdated thank goodness right. <laughs> but as a teacher I, and um I, I taught at a small country school i wanted my kids to be introduced to that book but i always waited until i had a very high functioning class you know one that read really well before i had them uh, read that that novel but it's a great story if you can get through the adjectives <laughs> and his attempt to write an Irish brogue. Oh yeah. That was That's my funny. students were reading that going, what's he saying? And I said, just sound it out and keep reading, you know. <laughs> um, but it did not, it did not really um impact me as a as a not one that I was gonna go back and revisit for literary purposes, hmm. but I did go back and revisit it for historical purposes, you know. Why do you think that it was so successful? What, what about it? The flood was in the papers all across the United States. Everybody would heard about the flood. And then here, just a couple years later, this novel comes out about the flood. And I think that was part of it. Also, the fact that Harold Bell Wright was, his name was uh, becoming very popular. I always tell visitors to the museum, he was kind of like James Patterson of his day. Everybody had heard of him. You know, he was a, a really well-known author at the time. And I, I think that was it, the, the timing of it and his name. And, you know, I mean, literary tastes are just different than if I was looking at, because his book, this Barbara White was the third best-selling book of 1911. And if you looked at the other 10 bestsellers of 1911, the only one anybody had heard of was a lesser known Edith Wharton novel. They're all forgotten. So, you know, people were willing to put up with a much more ornate prose style than we are now. And and the other thing about Barbara, Barbara Worth and, and Deborah, actually, when we were when I came down and interviewed you, had what I thought was a brilliant idea, which was to somebody needs to do a graphic novel of Barbara Worth because the story is actually really quite compelling. It's just the clunky writing gets in the way. And love the thing graphic about Barbara, novels. Yeah, it's the a thing great about, idea. Yeah, the she actually is kind of a great American heroine. I mean, she's sort of like a Gibson girl on horseback or something. She's very athletic. She's a skilled horseman. She's kind to people. Um, 
And I mean, despite everything, you do sort of fall at you feel a, a fondness for her or fall in love with her, despite all the, the pros cluttering around her. So I think for me, that was a big part of the appeal was that she just was, um, you know, I don't know, she's somehow akin to, you know, Daisy Miller or somebody. She's just a sort of all American girl on an adventure. And, and then, I think that was very appealing. Yeah. And that was it. She was not constrained by Eastern culture yep. and mores. Yep. She wore, uh, you know, clothes that you could ride a horse in and she didn't ride side saddle. No, yeah. sir. She had a Western saddle. She actually, in one scene in the book, she takes food to a Mexican laborer and his family, which that was big. Uh, that, that idea of, of uh, inclusiveness and helping others who were not the same as you, that was a big thing. Sure. And, and the fact that I always liked her because she liked the desert. I like the desert. That's why I live here, you know. And she liked it too. And when she can go out there and look across this barren wasteland and go, isn't that beautiful? Well, she won my heart. Yeah. And the, so the, you know, the, the water engineer from New York who she ends up marrying, I mean, she teaches him to love the desert too. She picks the guy from New York though. You kind of had to be in your bonnet about that, Peter, in your article. I did. And I, I still, it was just a surprise because, um, and, and actually the guy that, um, um, Gary Cooper plays the West, the local guy in the movie. Um, it um, and Ronald Coleman, yeah, plays him in the in, in the, the suave guy. No, it was a surprise, and um, I don't know why Harold Bell Wright did it, but it's wonderful to see Barbara Worth teach this guy from New York to love the desert and love the Imperial Valley as much as she does. And that's another thing I think that's really winning about the book is that. Um, Harold Bell Wright, and who was, you know, from upstate New York and, and spent also time in the Ozarks, really did love, come to love the California and the Southwest Desert. And he had a real feel for it. The, mm -hmm. the, the landscape descriptions are often the best thing in the book. Um, and, and so when you read the book and then you go out and, you know, sort of explore as, as I did when I was down there, you go, okay, you know, this, I can see this. I can see what got to him. Um, because it really is beautiful. So I wanna I wanna make sure we get to some audience questions. The the last thing I just want to clarify about the book, just for my own edification, why do you think that like we this isn't a so many of us haven't heard of it? There's a lot of books with, you know, a lot of adjectives um in them that we are to some extent forced to read growing up. And, you know, I took California history in high school and had to read a bunch of old California books. Why isn't The Winning of Barbara Worth one of those? That's an interesting question. Um, maybe because at the time, <laughs> at, okay, <clears throat> when you're a teacher, you're limited to how much time you can spend on various things. and. If I were to go through uh, that time period and find authors, I'd probably pick Twain before I'd pick Harold Bell Wright. He was still writing, you know. So I think some of it may just be the teachers have to pick and choose and which one they're going to get the most out of. I also think the fact that this is not a really good argument, but I was going to say because the Imperial Valley is kind of isolated and down in the corner. But then you look at Faulkner, who made up this little tiny county in the south, and it did OK, you know. I'm not sure why. Um, Peter, why? It's a really good question. I mean, the book that you don't most, I most, and I think other people most compare it to is Ramona by Highland Hunt Jackson in the 1880s, which is a similar romance. I mean, she wrote the book to try and, um, you know, reveal the injustices that were being perpetrated on Southern California Native Americans, but ended up writing this sort of romance that convinced that everybody that um, Southern California was the land of dreamy Spanish ranchos and everybody should move out and have a little ranch and a tile roof. And that, that I think they're comparable. They both, you know, that they, they generated both a big tourism business for whatever reason, Ramona was a longest, had a longer lasting impact. I don't think that many people still read the book, but there's still a Ramona pageant in Southern California. And, um, and it's the it's a slightly better book than Barbara Worth. 
but um, but you know, you figure out, you know, gosh, I mean, uh, more, uh, you know, ten years later after you know Barbara Worth was published, all of a sudden you have people like F. Scott F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway writing, and it's just an era where books, the language was just simpler, and you know, it's not, <laughs> um. So I think it became a hard thing to compete with those guys. Although I will, Harold Bell Wright wrote bestsellers all the way, you know, through the rest of his life. And one weird little fact that I'm going to insert because I think it's so bizarre. So his second book, the one he wrote right before Barbara Worth, The Shepherd of the Hills, became a movie with John Wayne in the early 1940s. And then in the late 1950s, these people in Branson, Missouri, which is where the book was set because he had been a preacher in Branson, thought, we're going to do an outdoor religious pageant based on this novel. That became so successful that it became what the start of the country music, you know, amusement mecca that Branson, Missouri is today. And there's a Harold Bell Wright Museum there, and there's a um, Shepherd of the Hills amusement park. So he had a bizarre skill to tap into something that Americans liked. <laughs> it's an um I want to I want to just point out some of the comments here. We have Lynn Lombardo, who I got to meet last night at our event, um, actually attended the Ramona pageant as a child. And, and so we have a Ramona pageant attendee. There's also I love that the apparently the El Centro Chamber of Commerce um, coined that kind of billboard phrase El Centro, where the sun spends the winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Clarissa kind of asks, and I, I guess, um, Deborah, you would know about this. Is it true that the Barbara Worth Hotel on Main Street, um, the entire town came to watch it burn down sometime oh. in the 1960s? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That hotel, it, it was a landmark. And as I said, it was it was done up to the, you know, it was the best. It was a four star in an area where they weren't giving ratings. I mean, it was great. And it was this huge old building, I think about, I'm not even sure, maybe four stories high or something, which is unusual here in the Valley because of earthquakes. We don't build tall buildings. And when it got, when it incinerated itself, I mean, it was huge. And, and the fire started in the basement. And so the flames were just shooting up. And I live in Holtville, it was 10 miles away. And I could see the flames from Holtville. I Whoa. could see the tops of the flames, and people from Brawley told me the same thing. They could see the flames, and they had the the, the, the blocks cordoned off, like four or five blocks away from the um, fire itself, because they were afraid it might spread. It was huge that fire. What it started was, it? I th I think it was just bad wiring, old wiring, oh, and it it sparked wiring. something down below. I'm not sure about that. Um, do you, Elizabeth asks, um, since the book was written during the lifetime of William Holtz, did he have any reaction to a character being presumably styled after him? I, I think he probably did, but I've never been able to find a, in fact, I've never found any articles about them together, but I did see on, um, Palosphere, I think it was, anyway, that Wright wrote a couple of the articles in Holt's home in Redlands. He was visiting Holt and wrote a couple of the chapters while he was there. I'd never seen that before until this morning when I was prepping for this. Thank you. Thank you. You know, so I don't know. I, I, that he had, you know, was probably a little chuffed about it, but he was, uh, from everything I gather, he's a pretty non assuming guy. All right. All right, fair enough. Um, I want to. We're we've gone over time. Um, and and I'm sorry we won't be able to get to all of the. Let's just do one more water question, then I'll do my my happy. Christy asks. Um, Peter, this might be for you. With ag taking eighty percent of our water and California crops feed the nation, do you see any answers? Do you think literature such as this novel, which I mean, we are now hearing about thanks to you doing this, Deborah's work with the museum. Um, can raise, can help raise awareness. I realize this is a gigantic topic. Well, again, one of the people uh, quoted in the article is J.B. Hamby, who's a Barbara Worth fan and a fan of uh, Devers Museum. And it was really interesting talking to him. I think he, he recognizes that uh, agriculture in California have very difficult choices to make. But on the other hand, it's also hugely important to the California economy. And 
Um, it's going to be tough. It's also not just limited to California. So Arizona's in the right. same boat. Um, you know, can uh, the Imperial Valley farmers around Yuma, uh, can they grow crops that, you know, use less water? Can you cover canals so that there's less evaporation? Are there, you know, smaller steps that you can take that can preserve agriculture while using less water? And I think um, that is going to be a big topic of discussion and debate and voting over the next quarter century. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. Last question for both of you. It's it's clear. Um, certainly, Deborah, you're, it's your hometown, your home region, um, your love for the Imperial Valley. Um, and Peter, you seem to, to have that as well. I had the best time there. It's a wonderful place. I had just a great time. Yep. Um, so I appreciate your appreciation for the specialness of it. Can you, for we're, we're all adding the winning of Barbara Worth to our reading list, if, if we can get past the purple prose. Um, can you recommend one or two other titles that are set um, or centered around the Imperial Valley that might be good reads if we wanted to continue our literary exploration of the area? I have two I would like to recommend. One of them is called Colorado Conquest by David O. Woodbury. Uh, published in 1941, but it is actually, it's historical, but there's also a little fictional element, and it's a really good account of the early days of living here, about, about uh, picking supplies up off the train in Nyland and taking three days to get it down to Glexco and by wagon, you know, which is really, it's only about, it's only about 40 miles, but, but because going through sand, it's really good about the pioneer days. And it also gives a really good blow by blow account of the break in the, in the, at the gate where the flood started and how they tried to fix it, putting down mats and things like that. It basically goes from the founding of the Imperial Valley to the building of Hoover Dam. It's that's Woodbury. The other one is Colossus, the turbulent saga of the building of Hoover Dam. And that's by Hiltzik. H-I-L-T-Z-I-K, and it was published in 2011. And again, the Hoover Dam probably would not be there were it not for the uh, lobbying and political machinations of some of the people from the Imperial Valley. Uh, they were really behind the push to put a dam in and, and tame the Colorado. So when you read that book, you're gonna get about the first two, three chapters are about the Imperial Valley. And then it goes to the actual building of the dam and how the laborers live there on site and pouring concrete 24 seven. And it's a fascinating account. I would recommend both those books. The second one, especially if you are interested in those early water rights, the Colossus is a good one. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to grab links to these as I can. And I know that my colleague, Jess Blau, is doing the same thing because we're going to send you an email with links to all of these. Don't worry. Peter, your pick. Okay, I got one book and two other things. All right. So the okay. book is A Newish History from University of Nebraska Press, The Settler's Sea by Tracy Bryn Voiles. And it's um, a environmental and political history of the Salton Sea starting you know, in before the arrival of Spanish and American explorers and settlers. So starting with indigenous peoples like the Cahuilla and then continuing on up into the present. And it um, it's really good. It's, uh, you know, the Salton Sea uh, is, you know, maybe the most critical, critically endangered part of the Imperial Valley as it dries up. Um, and and she traces sort of efforts to save and 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 use the sea um, and also the surrounding valley. And it's an academic history, but it's actually really quite well written. Then the other two things is everybody should go visit um, Deborah's excellent museum, the Pioneer Park Museum. Incredibly good display is on Harold Bell Wright, a really good upstairs display on the floods and the dam. And also you get a great sense of just how extraordinarily diverse the early population was of this valley as people came from all over the world to try and to get farmland. It's a, it's a terrific museum. It's about to close for the summer, but then you can go back in the in, in September. It's great. And then the other thing, and this is available on YouTube or just online, the movie The Winning of Barbara Worth is actually a hoot. Um, 
it's a silent movie, um, but it moves right along. Um, Gary, Kerper, Gary Cooper's first big role. And the flood scene, which apparently they did uh, both partly, they filmed it on this on the Black Rock in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, which is where Burning Man is now. Some of they filmed it some of them there, then they used a lot of miniatures in the studio. But the flood scene is very dramatic and it's mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fun movie. So those are my recommendations. Um, this has been fantastic. So eye-opening, so fun. Deborah, I can see why you are a really fun historian to talk to and you must have been a fantastic teacher. Um, and here, it's always a joy to get to hang out with you and have your work in Alta. This particularly is just wonderful. So thank you both for taking the time today. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, folks, I, before you leave, I do want to invite you next week, David L. Ulin, um, Alta's Books Editor. He's also the editor of Airlight Magazine. It's a literary journal published by the English Department at the University of Southern California. He will be telling us about that new project in conversation with editor-at-large Mary Melton. So please do join us for that. Um, and go visit the Pioneer Museum. Please. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.